Hello everyone, this is Jen, and I make useful English lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices, and more to help you get top grades in the subject. So for those of you who are studying Macbeth, I'm sure you have come across lots of analysis and videos on Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. And some of it may even be from my channel. And so if you haven't already watched my Macbeth character analysis, then make sure that you check them out in my ever expanding Macbeth playlist here, or you can find a link in my description box below. If you've seen my videos on Lady Macduff and the Porter, so you know that I have a soft spot for the minor characters. So today I'm going to be looking at Banquo, who's arguably not the most minor of characters in the play, maybe just secondary, but we know that Banquo is incredibly important as this character who can help us understand some of the biggest themes in Macbeth. So in this video, I'm going to offer my unique take on Banquo's significance in the play, which some of you may find surprising. So stick with me till the end of the video if you want a full, nuanced, sophisticated top grade analysis on Banquo, because I promise that this is going to be a character analysis that you're not going to find anywhere else. Let's go. Now, the most common interpretation of Banquo is that he is a foil to Macbeth. Whereas Macbeth is ruthless and evil, Banquo is righteous and noble. It's also worth noting that whereas Macbeth is childless, fruitless is the word in the play, Banquo has a son, Fleance, who is prophesied to one day become king. It's often noted that King James I was a descendant of Banquo from the Stuart line. So many scholars have suggested that by featuring Banquo in his Scottish play, Shakespeare was hoping to flatter the then newly anointed Scottish now English king, who also happened to be the new patron of his acting company, which was renamed to the King's Men in 1603, the year that James ascended to the throne. For more details on Shakespeare's historical context, you can check out my video here, which is going to be massively useful for your study of any Shakespeare. There's nothing wrong with all of these observations, but I find them a bit trite and predictable to make for sophisticated top brain analysis. So let's push a bit further by considering two questions. Why does Shakespeare use Banquo in particular as Macbeth's foil when he could have used an entirely new character for this, regardless of the fact that we know Shakespeare was adapting his characters from a source text, which was Raphael Holinshed's Chronicles, which I'll go on to explain in a bit. If Shakespeare had simply wanted to flatter James by featuring Banquo, why does he have Macbeth express a sense of outrage and scorn over the credibility of the seed of Banquo as kings, and possibly, by extension, plant this seed of thought in the audience's mind about the credibility of the real king who was James, who is indeed also a seed of Banquo by distant lineage? Had Shakespeare's intention of featuring Banquo been purely sycophantic, Making such an implication would have seemed like a politically risky, if not somewhat foolish, move. So, why Banquo? Let's start unpacking all of this by looking at the source text, Raphael Holinshed's Chronicles. Now, Chronicles is a 16th century account of England, Scotland, and Ireland's history up until the point of writing, of course. In this historical compendium, there's an episode on Macbeth's power grab, which is also the narrative that Shakespeare had adapted for the storyline of his play. Specifically, the Banquo in Holinshed's Chronicles cuts a very different figure from his Shakespearean counterpart. According to Holinshed, Banquo was the chiefest accomplice to Macbeth's purposed intent to slay King Duncan. In the play, however, Banquo remains loyal to Duncan till the very end, even though at one point he suspects the truth about Macbeth's foul play, but he never confronts Macbeth about his doubts. In a nutshell then, while Holinshed's historical Banquo is a morally compromised figure, Shakespeare's fictional Banquo is a morally righteous character. And so here lies an interesting question. 
What does Shakespeare's moral baptism of Banquo, so to speak, suggest about the power of narratives, and more specifically about the power of those who tell and retell narratives like Shakespeare? After all, if all it takes for a turncoat to be refashioned into a loyalist is a switch in modes of representation from history to drama, from documentation to narrative, then this easily gives rise to competing characterizations. But the version of character that is most likely to stick in the audience's mind isn't necessarily going to be the one that is true in the sense of historically accurate, but rather the one that is compelling because it's dramatically vivid. So in this light, then, historical truth appears to be a remarkably fragile and malleable construct. So the malleability of historical representation also links to one of the wider themes in the play, appearance versus reality. We know that this dichotomy applies very much to Macbeth. Macbeth appears loyal to Duncan on the surface, but is actually plotting a regicide behind the scenes. With Banquo, the appearance versus reality frame would also apply if we compared the source text, Chronicles, with the primary text, Macbeth. In the play, Banquo appears loyal to Duncan, but in history, he is actually implicit in the king's murder. So we see then that Banquo occupies this liminal, in-between kind of space, which crosses modal, moral, and existential lines, which are split between a historical versus fictional Banquo, which is the modal line, the mode of representation, of treacherous versus a loyal Banquo, which is the moral line, as well as a human versus a ghostly Banquo, which is the existential line. And we see the ghostly Banquo in Act 4, in the banquet moment. This interstitial nature of Banquo's character opens up another theme in the play, which is the difficulty of knowing which version of what is presented to trust. And we can link this to the historical context. Still raw from the traumatic memory of the 1605 gunpowder plot coup, this idea of not knowing whom and what to trust would have resonated very strongly with King James I, who was paranoid not just about witches, but also about potential Catholic insurgents, many of whom were all about him in court. By the way, guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel, and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. Now, if we close read Banquo's lines in the play, we'll see that Shakespeare might have been hinting at his conscious hitchhawking between the source text Banquo and his own reworked Banquo. In much of what Banquo says, he seems to constantly be nudging the audience to look beyond the surface and not to take what's in front of them for face value. This applies to his own characterization as well. Instead of accepting the romanticized, morally cleansed, Shakespeareanized version of Banquo, Perhaps the audience should look beyond at the real and much less noble version of Banquo as chronicled by Hollinshed, the historian. These subliminal hints are present right from the very start of the play. For example, in Act 1, Scene 3, where upon encountering the three witches with Macbeth on the heath, Banquo remarks on the witch's ontological and gender ambiguity, and ontological means related to the state of being, the actual state of existence. This idea of whether or not something exists is ontology. When he says, what are these so withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are on it? Live you, you should be women. And yet, your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. 
Likewise, soon after, when Banquo demands that the witches look into the seeds of time, say which grain will grow and which will not. This is an interesting quotation because the metaphor seeds of time suggests that Banquo is prodding the audience to delve deeper into history, perhaps alluding to a historical work like Hollinshed's Chronicles, and to consider which of the grains of his characterization, whether it's Hollinshed's documented Banquo or Shakespeare's dramatized one, will grow and which will not take root in everyone's minds long after he's gone from history and the stage. Interestingly, when Banquo responds to Macbeth's query about the witch's conflicting prophecy of both having Macbeth and Banquo's son become king, there seems to be a meta-theatrical wink couched in his sage words about the instruments of darkness, as when he says, and oftentimes, to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths. Win us with honest trifles to betrays in deepest consequence. Within the play's narrative orbit, these instruments of darkness refer, of course, to the witches, who tell the truth about Macbeth's kingship, but in an equivocating way, ultimately betraying Macbeth to the deepest consequence of his tragic fall and demise. But when placed in a broader context, these instruments of darkness could also be read as the Renaissance theatre and its accoutrements. The stage, the actors, the playwright, especially from the Protestant or the Puritan view, which saw the theatre as a dangerous place with the potential to pollute morals and taint minds. Very much instruments of darkness indeed. And yet, dark as drama and the stage may be, it nonetheless performs the function of telling us these truths about human nature with the honest trifles of stagecraft. And equally, if we let ourselves be too drawn into the doctor's narratives and alluring spectacle of the stage, then we will likewise be led to betray ourselves in deepest consequence, confusing fiction for reality and making wrong judgments about character. Now, by the time we get to the start of Act 3, the essence of Banquo's characterization is reflected when he ruminates over his suspicion of Macbeth's culpability in Duncan's death, when he says, I fear thou playst most foully for it. This moment is incredibly significant because it captures Banquo in what's arguably his most morally compromised state in the play. And this isn't because, as some scholars have suggested, Banquo turns a blind eye to Macbeth's foul play here, but rather Banquo is himself at the brink of moral failing, of being tempted to do exactly what Macbeth has already done by effecting a power grab. And we see this in the rhetorical question that he poses to himself. Right before the Macbeths, Lennox, Ross, and the rest of the crew enter the scene and interrupt his soliloquy, as when he muses, Why, by the verities on thee made good, may they not be my oracles as well, and set me up in hope? But hush, no more. And then we see the stage directions of Senate sounded, enter Macbeth as king, Lady Macbeth, Lennox, Ross, Lords, attendants, etc. So this moment is as close to the Hollinshed Banquo as the Shakespeare Banquo will get when the noble loyalist shows his human weakness and considers if he shouldn't also set aside his morals in pursuit of power if the witch's prophecy of Macbeth becoming king has actually come to pass. What stops Banquo, though, isn't so much a self-correcting moral awareness that pursuing Macbeth's course would be wrong, but the situational interruption of Macbeth and co. entering the scene, which then leads Macbeth to abandon this tempting, dangerous chain of thought. But had it not been for this timely but external intervention, perhaps Shakespeare's Banquo would have become Macbeth 
2.0. So if we consider just how close the Banquo in the play skirted the realm of the Banquo in history, well, once again, note the blurry, interfusing boundaries between conflicting versions of characterization and narratives. But then again, it's worth thinking if Hollinshed and Shakespeare's Banquos really are so different in their basic impulses of desiring power, despite the fact that they eventually made opposite moral decisions, which is to betray the king versus to stay loyal to the king. Now, finally, Banquo's appearance as an apparition in Act 4 poses the ultimate epistemological question about what is true and what isn't. Is his ghostly appearance a reality in the play? Or is it an imaginary figment in Macbeth's mind? After all, Lady Macbeth and the rest of the banquet attendees cannot see Banquo's ghost. So whose version of the narrative should we believe in? But do we actually even get to choose? Just as Shakespeare has already decided for us which version of Banquo he wants us to see, which is of course his moral version versus the historical one, he has also actually implicated us in which version of the Banquo's ghost narrative he wants us to believe in. And that is, of course, Macbeth's version. Because like Macbeth, we can see Banquo's ghost through the medium of Macbeth's hallucination. But if our vision is the same as Macbeth's, then does that make us complicit in Macbeth's guilty consciousness? Perhaps the bigger idea here then is that those who decide how the narrative is told have the ultimate power. And that as receivers of any narrative, we are by default at the mercy of the one who tells us these narratives. So linking it back to the historical context, considering that James I would have been an audience member of the play at some point, the implication here of Shakespeare being the more powerful agent because he's the one who controls the narrative, and the king being positioned as this passive narrative receiver seems like a rather cheeky, if not straight up audacious move. And that's it for this video, guys. I know this is probably one of those more nuanced interpretation analysis videos. So don't worry if you feel like some of the interpretation I've put forth here seems a little bit over your head. Just revisit the speeches I have referenced and make your own comparison between Hollinshed and Shakespeare's versions of Banquo. And of course, you can always rewatch and revisit different sections of the video and consider it alongside your own reading of the character. I think the key question is to consider why Shakespeare would have wanted to portray a different version of Banquo in light of both the historical and dramatic context of his own time. So I'd love to hear your own take on Banquo's significance in the play. So please do comment below with your thoughts and ideas and share them with the others so we can open up this interpretative space among ourselves as well. As always, if you found this video helpful in any way for your studies, hit that thumbs up button below so that YouTube would know to share this content with other passionate, top grade lit learners like yourself. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification button so that you never miss out on a weekly English Lit Study video from me going forward. And I will see you in the next one. Ciao!